Hi, this is Professor Tyler Watts from Ferris State University. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to run a classroom bread factory to teach about the production process, diminishing marginal product, the upward sloping supply curve, and market outcomes in a competitive industry. The bread factory is a classroom simulation of a real-world production process of uh, manufacturing bread. It represents all factors of production within the simulation or within the model, including land or natural resources, labor, workers, capital, meaning the equipment, tools, buildings, and so on that are used in the process, entrepreneurship, the owner and manager of the company who is interested in producing the product in order to sell it and make a profit, a given state of technology in the production process, and the passage of time. In the activity, students will actively observe diminishing marginal product, which is the intuition behind rising marginal cost and the upward sloping supply curve. The activity will further introduce students to income statement accounting, and with some assumptions about competitive markets, it will help them develop intuition about long-run market outcomes of the elimination of profits and the inexorable tendency towards innovation in the production process. Materials needed for the activity include either a blackboard and just a single piece of new chalk, or a whiteboard and five or six whiteboard markers. A watch or timer to keep track of the one minute intervals that are used for the production process. Smartphone timer apps work very well for this. Microsoft Excel with a projector so the class can see your Excel workbook open as you record data and work through the income statement. And if you're interested in running the activity in your classroom as I prescribe in the video, please email me at the address given and I will be happy to supply you with the exact version of the Excel spreadsheet that I use. And finally a multi chalk or marker holder such as what is used by music teachers to draw a music staff on the chalkboard. These are available for chalk and for markers. These will be used towards the end of the activity to give students some additional insight about the application of technology in a production process aimed at reducing cost of production and increasing profitability. To begin, introduce the activity to the students in the following manner. Today we will be simulating a real-world production process. We will represent all of the actual inputs in this process and record the outputs. As in any economic model, this activity captures the essence of the economic process in a highly simplified form. We are mainly interested in this question, how does output change when we can only change one input? So the next step then is to ask students what's involved in the bread making process. What inputs are involved? Um, what procedures are involved? And we really just want to make a comprehensive listing of all the things required for making a bread. And we'll categorize them in this fashion. Raw materials, labor, capital, which is tools and equipment, entrepreneurship, technology, the process itself, and of course the passage of time. Next, you explain the simulation procedure. Workers, who will be the students, will simulate making a loaf by simply writing the word bread in the designated space on the board during the allotted time period. The act of writing is going to represent in the simulation the actual process of mixing the ingredients, kneading dough, putting loaves into the oven, baking them for a certain amount of time, and so on. The designated space on the board will represent the factory space itself, the capital, with all the countertops and sinks and bowls and ovens and what have you. And the allotted time period, which is one minute, will represent for us in the simulation the passage of a complete working day. So in this manner we have included in the simulation all of those input categories that we just talked about. And it's important to point this out, the simulation is comprehensive, it's it's extremely simplified version of reality, but it is comprehensive in that it captures or represents all of the different inputs and factors that are actually required to make actual bread. We need to model all the steps of making bread. So let's first off think about the inputs or the ingredients we need to make bread. The raw materials, that is represented by the piece of chalk. Right? This represents the flour, water, yeast, eggs, what have you, that is used, mixed together, and then baked into the bread. Okay, so I'm going to give the workers the piece of chalk, and they're going to uh, use it to make the bread. The mixing bowl and oven and everything else, the building, all the equipment, the supplies, the electricity, that's represented by the space on the board and this, it, this represents the factory itself. Now note here that all bread production has to take place within the factory space. We need to include the person who uh, starts the business, who organizes the business, who earns the profits if it succeeds, takes the losses if it fails. 
You got it. Yeah, yeah. Entrepreneur. entrepreneur. Okay, so we need an entrepreneur to manage the process. What about the human resource? So we need bakers, people. Okay, so I've got a pool of labor. I'll use you guys to represent my labor. I'm the entrepreneur. I'm organizing the whole thing. Uh, passage of time. Our working period is going to be one minute, and that's going to represent, say, a working day at the bread factory. Does the bread make itself? A process. We need a process. We're going to ultra simplify the process. Writing represents the process. However many times you can write the word bread in a minute, that will be the output of bread we produce in the bread factory in our simulation. The final task is to simply set the timer, run the simulation starting with one worker, and then repeat with a, a second worker, and then a third worker, fourth, fifth, Usually five workers is sufficient, and we'll also typically begin to observe strongly diminishing marginal product in the simulation by the fourth worker. We want to record the results in the Excel spreadsheet. The instructor in the class, who is representing the entrepreneur in the process, has the task of quality control of, of reading the student's work and only selecting those instances of the word bread that are clear and legible. And as I state to my students, I'm quality control and I'm not going to let bad batches of bread leave the factory. And in this way, the instructor does have a little bit of discretion and can, in a sense, dial in the output levels for each iteration of the activity with varying numbers of workers to help obtain a more smooth result. Although you'll notice that it's, it's just very natural because of the underlying economic phenomenon at work for a diminishing marginal product to occur. And so you may or may not need to help out the process as it goes. word bread as many times as you can yes. inside the space I'm, and I'm going to be quality control by the way and uh, I'm going to come and I'm going to count and it has to be legible and if it's illegible that represents like a loaf that went bad and we can't sell here's your raw materials okay write it inside the factory space okay. and as soon as uh, she's ready take up Once we've run the simulation with one through five workers, 
recorded the results, and sent the student workers back to their seats, it's time to turn to the Excel spreadsheet and discuss results. This is the Excel spreadsheet, blank with no data, and the way I like to set this up at the beginning of class is just allow students to see on the edge of the screen here the columns for number of workers, quantity produced, and marginal quantity. And as the rounds are completed with one, two, three through five workers, the results can be entered. I enter the results of each trial immediately after students have completed the round. And as you can see in this situation, I was able to observe a pretty smooth diminishing marginal product result. If you don't observe a smooth diminishing marginal product result, you can simply utilize the stylized data set that I also provide in the first sheet of this workbook, where we have actually marginal product initially increasing with a slightly more efficient second worker, but then steadily declining in a smooth pattern. It's permissible to use the stylized data for the follow-up analysis once you get students to realize that you will at some level of production see diminishing marginal product and we've just smoothed these numbers out here to make the math a little cleaner and the graphs that we'll be using later in the analysis a little bit smoother. So once the trials have been run and the data entered it's time for some discussion with the students. Now as we've just noted diminishing marginal product will typically occur starting with the third worker. Of course you want to explain to the students what diminishing marginal product means. What we mean is that we have less extra output obtained from each additional unit of any given input holding other inputs fixed. And of course in this simulation we are holding everything except labor fixed. And I usually pause at some point to address the realism of this assumption to my students. In the short run, which is maybe tomorrow, could we add more workers doing basic work in our factory? The answer is sure. We could call up a labor agency, get some workers in there, maybe spend half a day training them, and then they would be up and running. So it's realistic that we could add workers in the short run, but we can't add to the factory in the short run. You know, to, to build more factory space, to buy and install more equipment, would maybe re require uh, a, a whole construction process or rearrangement of the current factory, and that would take much more time than is available in the short run. So it is realistic that in the short run, most of the inputs or some of the more important inputs like capital are indeed fixed. And so when, when we add extra variable inputs like labor, they are going to run up against the constraint of the fixed inputs. And hence, we are going to observe diminishing marginal product in the short run. And as we mentioned, students will realize that diminishing marginal product occurs because the workers run out of space. And I'll often ask the students, why did we observe this phenomenon? and they'll say flat out, well, we just ran out of space to work. And remember, the space on the chalkboard or the whiteboard represents capital, the factory itself with all of its equipment. So what we're actually seeing here is that after the second or third worker, additional workers are running into an increasingly binding constraint due to the fixed inputs. It's important to spend a little bit of time talking about the reasoning behind diminishing marginal product and why we just observed it in the activity. Once we've got a good grasp of that, we can move on to talking about the relationship between diminishing marginal product and rising marginal costs. And here's the best way to explain it. We assume that all workers are paid the same wage, a realistic assumption for workers of a given job description and a given basic skill level. And most of the per loaf costs consist of labor because the cost of materials can, is such a small component of each loaf and we're not adding to fixed costs in the short run. So when we increase output, the main cost we're increasing is that cost of hiring extra workers. And that will become very clear when we look at the accounting data in the spreadsheet. With that in mind, we can easily see that marginal cost, which is of course the extra cost associated with extra units of output, is approximated by simply dividing the wage, the extra dollars we're spending on extra workers, by the marginal product. Here's what that looks like for my stylized bread factory result. This table puts the workers across the top row, the marginal product of each worker across the second row. So the first worker produces all 20, the second worker produces an additional 15 for a total of 35, 
The third worker produces an additional 10 for a total of 45. The fourth worker produces an additional 5 for a total of 50. The fifth worker produces an additional 2 for a total of 52. But each worker costs an additional $10. And that's what occurs here in the numerator in the third row. And marginal cost, remember, is approximated by that wage, the additional cost of that output divided by the marginal product, that additional output. So we're dividing 10 extra dollars of spending to produce the 20 extra loaves for a marginal cost of 50 cents per loaf, roughly, for the first worker. For the second worker, only producing an extra 15 while still costing an extra $10 has a marginal cost approximated by 67 cents per loaf. And then 10 extra dollars for the third worker, but only 10 extra loaves, so $1 is the approximate marginal cost for that range. Fourth worker costs an extra 10 again, but only produces five, $2 marginal cost. And the fifth worker costs an extra 10 again, but only produces an extra two, so a $5 marginal cost. So we can clearly see here that the diminishing marginal product result combined with the fact of a constant cost of additional workers results in an increasing marginal cost function. When we graph that, we can see the rising marginal cost curve, which of course we will be relating to the supply curve in the course of the activity. So let's move on and discuss the firm accounting that we'll derive from the activity and the inferences we can make from that about the competitive entrepreneurial market process. The Excel spreadsheet used to record the results of the bread factory simulation also contains some fairly thorough accounting data, which will be used to calculate the revenue of the bread factory. Total revenue is simply the quantity at each input level times the price per loaf, which will be a given and will be entered into the spreadsheet, but will be subject to change once a competitive pricing process steps in. The costs, which are divided into the familiar fixed costs and variable costs. If your students are not familiar with fixed and variable cost concepts, I recommend spending a bit more time familiarizing them with these concepts before jumping into the accounting in the Excel file. Total cost then is simply the sum of fixed and variable costs. And with total revenue and total costs in hand, we are ready to calculate profits, which of course is simply total revenue minus total cost. And this is the one number in the income statement that the entrepreneur is most interested in, given that we assume the entrepreneur is driven by the desire to maximize profits. Finally, we can also think about a rudimentary rate of return concept I've added this into the accounting mainly to show that profits are extremely high in the beginning of the process. There's going to be a strong lure for other entrepreneurs to enter into this line of business, replicate the process, and try to achieve similar profits. But that in turn will instigate the phenomenon of price competition, which will eventually prove to be the undoing of these lucrative profits and the establishment of an expected long-run equilibrium in which profits have been competed away and eliminated through the actions of rival entrepreneurs. Now as we work through the bread company's income statement accounts, we'll be able to observe the upward sloping supply curve, which we've already discussed, the profit maximizing output level, which of course is defined by the marginal cost equals marginal revenue rule, which your students may be familiar with, and if so, you can just point out that profit maximization occurs where MC is approximately equal to MR. Now the major lessons I like to teach with this are about what we can expect in the long run in a competitive market process. Now we're building these results on a few key assumptions. One is that the technology or production process is known and this industry is open to competition. And furthermore, the product is fixed in its features and quality. In other words, it's a commodity type product where the product itself is not really subject to being improved. Now what do we observe as a result of the long run competitive process? Competitors will step in and replicate the process and product, engage in price competition to gain market share. Profits are eventually eliminated, reduced to a normal rate through competition, and therefore entrepreneurs must engage in process innovation, and of course, not shown in this model, product innovation as well, in order to cut costs and reestablish profits. As innovations reduce production costs, prices are competed down, to the point where price equals minimum average total cost in the long run, a result economists get excited about because, as we know, that means maximum efficiency in the production of this product. We cannot produce the product at a lower cost. 
And to really understand that phenomenon, it's time to go into the Excel spreadsheet. So we've already established the first three columns of data, which is simply the number of workers, the quantity produced by each, and then, of course, the marginal quantity, okay? the concepts of fixed cost, and we're assuming a, a simple fixed cost of $100 per day. Remember, this is on a per day basis. To simply own the factory, to have the factory. Variable costs, we've also uh, discussed this. Workers are paid $10, and so that rises steadily by $10 as we add each additional worker. And you'll note here that all the cost totals are built on formulas with cell reference in the worksheet. Materials cost is simply assumed to be 10 cents worth of materials per loaf, and so that's calculated on that basis. 0.1 times the quantity of loaves produced, and these formulas all carry down. And then total cost is simply the sum of fixed cost and the two variable cost items. And again, that formula carries down. Average total cost, which we're interested in here primarily for the sake of finding its minimum point, and it's a simple formula of dividing the total cost by the quantity produced. Again, done with Excel, with cell references, and that formula carries down. Okay, then marginal cost. Now, marginal cost is approximated because we're not dealing with one unit increments of output, but these, but these lumps. And how this works is simply the change in cost over this range of output divided by the marginal quantity. So we basically have a delta cost here divided by a delta quantity here, and that's going to approximate marginal cost for us. And once again, that formula simply carries down. Now the sale price is given or assumed at the beginning and it's simply entered into this cell and it carries down through cell reference for the remainder of this column. So as we start thinking about changing sale price and why will we change it? Well because we'll realize that at our starting price the initial bread firm is making large profits and so that is going to entice competitors to come in and offer a lower price. Simply change the sale price in the top cell there and it carries down through all the others so we can have an accurate calculation of total revenue and you'll note that total revenue is simply the sales price times the total quantity produced again that formula carries all the way down and then profit and this is what we're interested in it's been color coded a little bit to help us interpret it profit is simply total revenue entries for column n minus total cost the entries for column j in our initial rendition we'll go back to a, the starting price of three dollars the bread factory is maximizing its profits $135.80 per day using all six workers in a quantity of 102. Now of course maybe only ran it with five workers simple adjustment eliminate the entries for the sixth worker and we'll see that profit is maximized at five workers producing 98 loaves earning the firm $134.20 per day in profits which is nearly an 84 percent return on the costs invested by the entrepreneur. And I ask my students if they think that's a good rate of return, and uh, most of them will realize, yeah, that that's a really nice rate of return. And this is per day, mind you. So students will realize that this, these profits are extremely rich, and I'll then proceed to ask them, well, you're an entrepreneur, you're a capitalist, you want to make money too, you see me making these huge profits in my bread factory, what are you likely to do? And Sometimes it takes some coaxing, but eventually they'll realize that they should get into this industry as well and try to replicate what I'm doing in order to replicate these profit levels. Then I'll simply ask them this. Well, how can you take market share for me to capture more of the market for yourself and therefore get in on this lucrative business? And they'll also quickly realize that if they cut the price just a little bit, they could still be earning large profits. Notice that our maximum profit still at a quantity of 98 with five workers. It's, it's been cut down a little bit, but the profit rate is still quite large, and this business is still doing quite well for its owner. And we have two, three, four competitors. I'll usually pick out students who respond and ask them, okay, what price will you set? They'll, they'll shade the price. I'll say, okay, that means I'll have to come back and offer a lower price myself and now we can get into a pricing war back and forth we go maybe 10 20 cent increments somebody will make a big move 50 cent increment and we'll notice we're still making really large profits 53 percent per day is still fantastic it's still just amazingly large so we'll work through the process of having the price competed down but at some point i'll kind of stop and ask the students okay well how low can the price possibly go and where do you think we're going to wind up 
I might cue them in by saying, like, think about the average cost. This is the per unit cost. And what's the lowest it can possibly be? And if I point the students to these numbers, they'll realize, well, the, the cost can't get lower than $1.63. And I'll say, right, so what does that imply about how low the price can possibly go? Well, they'll realize that means the price can't possibly go below 163 And in fact, it has to be a little bit above that because we're rounding down. So maybe we'll set the price to 164 So there's still this modicum of profit being earned. Because, of course, if the price went below 163 the, the lowest possible average cost, then this firm wouldn't be making any money at all. And of course, it would have to close down in the long run. But let's go back to our situation in the basic scenario where price has been competed all the way down to basically the minimum point on the average cost curve. Now, at this point, it's useful to look at the graph, which I have down here if we just scroll down. And what we see here is we have uh, average cost, marginal cost, and price, or marginal revenue. Now, one reason it's beneficial to add a sixth worker is simply to make this graph more complete. I've set the price back to our initial given value of 3. When we look at the graph of price in blue, average cost in red, and marginal cost in green, we can see the price is well above that a large range of the average cost curve. That means large profits are being made. Now the beneficial aspect of the competitive process, of course, we change the price step back down to the long run competitive level is we see that the price has collapsed to equal roughly the lowest point on the average total cost curve. Also the intersection of marginal cost with average cost. And that of course indicates that we're now producing the good at the lowest possible cost and basically all profit has been taken away from the businesses in the industry. The final point we want to make in reflecting on this competitive profit-seeking process is the spur towards innovation that it creates for entrepreneurs. And I'll introduce this innovation phenomenon in the following way. This is my bread factory and I'll tell my students, you know, I'm not too satisfied with my profits being competed away. We were making really fat profits and living well and these pesky upstarts have entered my industry, copied my process, bid down the price, taken my customers and t eventually taken pretty much all of my profits away. And I want my profits back. So I asked the students, how could Profit Max, that's me, get my profits back? A lot of the students will say, well, let's make a better loaf of bread. Let's make something tastier, more nutritious, lower fat, what have you. And I'll, I'll encourage that kind of thinking. I'll say, you know, that's, that's right on the mark in terms of what businesses actually do. But for this exercise, we just want to assume that the product really is fixed. It's a 16-ounce loaf of wheat bread, and that's pretty much established as to its nature and quality. So I'm not going to allow you to change that for now. There's still a way to think about getting profits back. And of course, in order to increase profits here, we have to tackle the cost curve. So how can we push costs down in the production process when the price of the, and the product are fixed? That's where the multi-chalk or multi-marker apparatus comes into play. You can put two or three, or if you want, try five pieces of chalk in them. And I tell my students that I've hired some uh, research and development staff, some engineers, and I said, come up with a way to increase our bread output without increasing our costs. And after many long nights in the lab, they came back to me and said, Watts, we've got it. I, I produced this tool and begin writing on the board. One worker now is as productive as two, three, or five workers were before. Now, of course, this means one worker can fill up my entire factory. And if I really want to take advantage of this, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to build another factory. Usually when I run the simulation, the students ask me to do that anyway by the time we get to five workers. So in the long run, the combination of my new technology, which increases per worker productivity and a larger factory, I could maybe push my cost curve down and establish these efficiencies and scale economies in production that will allow me for a time to get my profits back. Of course, we'll realize that eventually my competing firms will try to copy my new technology and my new process, replicate it themselves, expand their own factories, and again, launch into that price war phenomenon. But in the meantime, we can scroll down here and look at uh, round two of the factory, where I have both increased my capacity by expanding my fixed costs, doubling the size of my factory, and notice increased both t total and marginal quantity through the application of these new 
techniques, the new technology, the tools that make my workers more productive. In this uh, simple case here, I've just basically just doubled output at every level. And that enables me to think about going well above the number of workers that, that I had before, assuming the same cost of labor, so adding cost at a rate of 10. And notice that we still see diminishing marginal product, but it doesn't set in until a higher level of output and a higher number of workers. So we are able to expand and get more out of a larger workforce with this new technology. And where, where price had collapsed to in, in the previous round, $1.64, we see that I'm now earning large profits again. Of course, I'm not maxing out my total labor force because of diminishing marginal product and the fact that these workers don't add enough to revenue to justify the, their addition to costs. We can think about that once again by thinking about the MC equals MR rule. We're not going to hire workers beyond the point where marginal cost is above 164, and that technically occurs between the 7th and 8th, so uh, worker number 7 is going to be our profit max level, as indicated by the highlighted cell here in the profit column. But that's a lot of profits again, 130 per day, 44% of costs per day, and I'm, I'm satisfied. So I'll chug along at this uh, high level of profits again, of course, until my competitors start copying me, replicating my new technology, expanding their own factories, and then the price war can start afresh, and the price can get bid down again in increments until we reach a point where price can go no further. And by now, students should know to look at the average total cost curve and find the minima of average total cost, which of course is going to occur somewhere in here six or seven workers, 250 or 260 units at a cost of $1.14. And we can simply jump to the end of the process, type that in, and realize that indeed my profits have essentially been eliminated once again through the competitive process. The observation we want to make is that price has declined consistently over the course of the entire exercise from $3 to 164 to 114 and I'll usually conclude by asking the students, are we going to stop here or are profit-hungry entrepreneurs going to continually be searching for new technologies and new innovations that can keep pushing those cost curves down even farther in order for them to try to maintain a hold on these illusory profits? And of course, the students will by this point realize that the process of innovating and reducing costs through competition and the quest for profits is a never-ending process. And what it results in for us is a continual reduction in the cost of almost all of our everyday consumer items. And we can think about examples going back to the example of bread. And here's uh, bread for sale at one of my favorite uh, discount grocery chains, Aldi, for an amazing 69 cents per loaf. Bread has never been cheaper regardless of how you measure it. You go back 100 years, bread cost about 6 cents per loaf. Workers earned about 24 cents per hour, meaning that it costs an average worker 15 minutes of work to buy that loaf. Now, even if the price of bread were a dollar, workers earn $30 an hour on average for production workers. That means bread only costs two minutes of work. So the, the work cost time has declined sharply. If we had think about the inflation adjustment, the, the price has still gone down, just not as sharply. One of the, the points of the exercise is that because of the relentless pursuit of innovation and cost cutting through the competitive market process, the cost of pretty much everything has just continually fallen. Competitive market process generates innovation, constantly falling prices and costs and improved standard of living. Some of the most important lessons in economics. I hope you found this video useful and I hope you'll try the bread factory in your own class. It's fun, it's interactive, students really enjoy it, and it teaches core microeconomics principles in a hands-on intuitive manner. Thank you for watching. Please check out YouTube channel for more classroom activity, instructional videos, lecture videos, feature videos, all kinds of economics videos.